So essentially, when, um, as you know, we this is about the uh, consumption fund NFO, where um, we will be focusing on the key consumption themes. While people may think that, uh, or there is a popular view that consumption involves your traditional FMCG category or some bit of autos, but the fact is consumption in the universe is much, much, much broader than that. And given the evolution of consumption patterns over the uh, over the last few years since COVID, especially, and how consumption patterns, how distribution patterns uh, have changed, uh, this has led to a lot of uh, business opportunities, and that is now translating into investment opportunities for us, as a lot of companies are uh, uh, coming forward with their IPOs, which were previously privately owned entities, and also otherwise existing. Uh, traditional uh, companies, FMCG companies also venturing into these areas to take kind of take advantage of uh, of, of the entire evolve, evolving consumer scenario, right? So the things that to highlight how things are changing from a consumption uh, uh, point of view, just from a just anecdotally, um, if you think at think about few key things like food, for instance, uh, we've gone from consuming uh, basic foods to, uh, to go, going towards more exotic, wanting to try all cuisines thanks to internet. Essentially, whether you are in metro city or a tier two, tier three city, the information dissemination or information distribution has is quite uniform and people have the same access to the same information irrespective of where they live. So, so the, the aspirations accordingly has increased as well, whether be it in a metro city or be it in a tier two, tier three city. So to that extent, people's uh, inclinations to want to travel, to want to try different cuisines, to try something like organic food, all these things have in, in, increased. And uh, that that results in increasing price points from a from a purely business perspective. Same thing with fashion landscape. Uh, it is more towards fast fashion um, that that which is where the preference is, and that also has meant uh, better market opportunities. If you look at home home uh, home uh, real estate uh, purchases and trends within real estate purchases, especially with after COVID, people have this preference for larger houses. Uh, thanks to uh, work from home and also people want uh, close communities uh, where they have all sorts of facilities that come within those communities and so that is also value additive in a sense and lastly we all know about cars how there is a preference for uh, preference for SUVs over entry level cars and that has been that change has been quite radical and even in terms of price points as i will show you in one of the later slides which i think is one of the most interesting uh, data points is that the preference for premiumization the preference for uh, now it is no longer about it is no longer about, no longer about needs but it is basically about wants as to what do you want rather than what do you need, given that uh, the needs are, we, we are developing at a reasonable pace and the needs of uh, a significant chunk of the population has been met. So now it, has been, it is moving on to what your wants are in life and that is what is translating into better uh, consumption uh, demand across the curve, right? So this is, as I, as I mentioned briefly, this is translating into a whole range of uh, a whole range of uh, 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 transformations at a business level for instance you go from a kirana store to to a uh, to a modern uh, uh, you go to malls hyper hypermarket and so on and so forth and now you now we've gone to e-commerce and now quick commerce like people previously used to question including myself why would you need something delivered in 10 20 minutes but quick commerce is picking up a significant market share there showing there is a there is a need for uh, there is a uh, unmet need for such uh, for for that service and uh, and for that requirement right um, these are just some of the examples of how we are moving up the value chain, going from standard watches to smart watches to fitness bands and from headphones to earbuds. I'll just keep this slide in the interest of uh, uh, time. I'll just focus on some key slides. So as I was saying over the last three years, three, four years, consumption pattern and consumption um, consumption trends have changed significantly. And this slide kind of highlights uh, the inherent changes. So if you look at the top line, the maroon line in there, 
and you look at the age group as we all know our country's age group is more in the range of 18 to 44 uh, age group cohort and there if you see look at the maroon line so pretty much everybody is saying 70% of the population, 70% or more is saying that they discover uh, products often through social media um, than, than any other way. And also if they if they if the if the response on social media is positive, then they are it more it is more likely to impact their buying decision in a very positive way. So the whole concept of how from the point of how you how you discover new products to how you shortlist products and then subsequently even how you buy these products has changed subs sub substantially from a client perspective or from a customer perspective and how it gets delivered to the end customer has changed from a company perspective so which is where the uh, the companies have had to adapt and so traditionally companies fmcg companies uh, the traditional large FMCG companies that had an advantage in creating new products because they had a, a huge access to huge distribution platform that is no longer as valid because there are today you have a lot of D2C brands which uh, are able to launch customized good products and are able to leverage uh, distribution uh, through different platforms and thereby get access to uh, different parts of the country and thereby be able to deliver their product to different parts of the country. So some of the advantages that the traditional uh, FMCG companies do, do that they had is kind of being diluted away. Obviously, these traditional companies are not sitting on their laurels. They are kind of trying to build uh, new skill sets and trying to uh, adapt these new technologies to their own advantage. But what I'm saying, what I'm trying to highlight is there is disruption in terms of how the entire cycle kind of plays out. Now, in terms of what is driving consumption, uh, there are six main factors that are driving consumption. One is rise in per capita income, which is where once we've called, crossed a certain threshold of around two thousand dollars per uh, per capita, essentially the requirement goes from uh, wants to needs, which I was highlighting previously. Uh, again, demographics: uh, we have a good cohort age age percentage of population between fifteen to forty four age group, and that age group is more uh, has has a much more inclination to spend, um, uh, which kind of aids this whole thing. Third is urbanization. As we urbanize, uh, the consumption patterns change, uh, which I will highlight in a slide later on, which lends itself to uh, uh, better consumption of services and so on and so forth, and even at consumption at better price points. Uh, the fourth important one is premiumization, which uh, is quite key, as we will highlight in cases like cars or even something like detergents and so on and so forth. FMCG companies have talked about how they are pushing premiumization forward. Uh, we've already touched on digitalization. And the last thing is credit. Credit availability has been one of the key things driving consumption. Favorable demographics along, as I said, with favorable demographics, they have, there is an inclination to spend. And there is no longer uh, that uh, stigma against uh, credit. So they are also open to taking credit. And the availability of credit has kind of facilitated that uh, that's, uh, uh, increase in consumption, consumption spending that we've seen over the last few years. So these are the six main drivers that we will continue to focus on. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, our, uh, our per capita income crossed $2,000 uh, in 2020. And typically, if you look at the chart on your right, as, um, as uh, uh, per, ca per capita income uh, crosses $2,000, um, that, that is like a critical inflection point. So even within that, what we see is that the percentage of low-income households has gone down to 52 to 30 percent, and it is expected to go down to 13 percent by 2031. But it's a sizable decrease from 2015 to 2023, where it has gone down by almost 22 percent. And instead, what you're seeing is an increase in upper middle class uh, uh, percentage, percentage of uh, families in the upper middle class from 14 to 31 percent and is expected to go to 46 percent. So essentially the lower middle class is kind of the percentage of decrease in lower middle class is, is, is reflected on the other side with an increase in upper middle class category and the high class, high income class category is also showing reasonable growth. But this cohort, which is the lower middle class and the upper middle class, as it, as it continues to grow significantly with uh, higher aspirational values, uh, or higher aspirations in terms of uh, experiences and consumption, that that will be kind of positive for the theme. Um, so 
the other the other chart that i highlighted which is urbanization uh in we are we are constantly evolving in terms of urbanization 20 2012 uh, th uh percentage of urban population was 30 uh 2022 percentage of urban population is around 36 um, and what you're seeing is if you look at the chart on the right uh, as urbanization increases that spending pattern changes in rural wallet share if a, a person in the rural area spends 100 rupees of that 100 rupees 50 rupees gets spent on food 21 rupees on household services and so on and so forth so food takes the major chunk but when you come to urban uh, spending that drops by almost 10 percent where you are now spending around 40 rupees on uh, food and that is uh, the higher amount is being spent on uh, household services fmcg which is around five uh, uh, increased health and education and uh, uh, is other bucket that sees an increase in spending so the nature of spend kind of evolves as you go from uh, a rural to a urban wallet share which again is is positive for uh, consumption in general uh, this uh, a theme of premiumization i'll touch on it briefly uh, we've seen um, premiumization across the space where air traffic has uh, air traffic has touched an all time high um, even if you think about uh, tourism domestic tourism in some instances some locations Domestic tourism is costlier than international tourism with certain locations that tells you that tourism is quite strong and people do have the propensity to want to see, uh, want to experience different things. And that can also be seen in the uh, uh, person, like the percentage of iPhone market share in our domestic markets and so on forth, so forth. But the best example is actually um, when you see the top 10 models uh, every year, card card models that are sold, top 10 models, uh, highest selling card models every year. So if you go to 2014, and if you look at the top five models, you have a Desire, Swift, Bolero, Wagon R, and then you have an Alto, with exception of an Innova. So what you essentially see is like the five of the six models are all hatchbacks, entry level models with an uh, with an average price uh, uh, with an average price of probably around uh, four and a half five lakhs. Uh, now you come to 2024, the top selling models are Nexon, Scorpio, Innova, Creta, Brezza, Grand Vitara. And with Nexon, uh, Nexon is the low, uh, is the cheapest amongst this lot, Nex Nexon and Brezza. And if you look at the average price of this bucket, now you're talking about an average price of around 14 to 15 lakhs. So not only is there, in, not only is there a shift from uh, from uh, from hatchbacks to SUVs, uh, but also within uh, within that spectrum, you're looking at at the higher end of the spectrum in terms of just the average uh, average prices. So as we aspire to get these better models, what it means is that we want models with better features that requires better uh, uh, and those features in turn help the supply chain because if you want uh, if you want ADAS for instance then uh, all the parts require ADAS is a high uh, ASP uh, high uh, price component and that component impacts the supply chain because as the demand goes up the auto supply chain benefits disproportionately uh, benefits disproportionately especially if the shift is this large so it benefits not just the not just the end companies but also the complete supply chain when you go from entry level cars to uh, SUVs and uh, uh, SUVs with uh, added features and dimensionalities and so on and so forth. Um, the other part to highlight is uh, e-commerce penetration, where while we have seen significant improvement in e-commerce penetration, there is still a large there is a long way for us to grow. Um, so as you see, our e-commerce penetration is only 8.4%, whereas some of the Asia, Asian countries uh, have much higher e-commerce penetration with Korea at around 358 um, and Singapore and China being there, thereabouts in terms of penetration. So while we've done a lot in, uh, thanks to cheap internet prices, there is still significant area for uh, growth uh, in e-commerce, uh, in quick commerce, because just in terms of sheer penetration, there is a lot more that we can do. So that is again expected to be uh, a general tailwind. Lastly, one of the, uh, I'll just highlight the last driver, which is easy credit. Um, as you can see here, retail loans as a percent uh, growth on a year on year basis has been on an average around 15 to 17%. 
while RBI has expressed concerns around the fact that the retail loan growth remains con remains strong. But the fact is, if you compare us to other uh, countries in the region, uh, our credit penetration is still pretty low. Uh, compared to the likes of Brazil or China, our credit penetration is still low. Um, and even within that, if you look, but despite that, if you look at the trends, we've seen uh, credit cards outstanding growth, CAGR growth of around 16.7%. As you can see on the table below, and the credit cards uh, number of credit cards outstanding has grown by around 16 to 17 percent per annum, and the average credit card spend uh, has grown from 6,000 rupees on a uh, six uh, sorry six billion rupees has has, to, has now grown to 18 billion. So that's a growth of almost around 25 percent. Uh, so the so easy credit is again one of the major drivers that that is kind of aiding the consumption theme. So these in I'm happy to take questions on on the themes, but essentially these are the main themes themes that we'll be focusing on while trying to build this consumption fund. Now stepping into some fun fact before I step into the strategy itself, um, India is one of the uh, largest consumer markets in the world. But more importantly, it has the highest growth rate, which I find, uh, I mean, I found the statistic personally very interesting because if you think about it, you find markets that are fast growing or you find markets that are large. You very seldom find opportunities, markets that are both large and fast growing. And India offers one of those uh, few opportunities, not, for, not just for domestic companies, but also for international companies, which is why all of them continue to remain interested in the markets because this combination of large being a large market and the fastest growing market in the world, uh, they don't come across as easily, right? Because we can offer scale and growth. That is our distinct advantage. Now, uh, just to talk briefly about the fund itself, the consumption fund will be benchmarked to in Nifty India Consumption Index. Within the Nifty India Consumption Index, 34% uh, uh, is FMCG, 22% is auto, auto components. 14% is consumer services, which is retailing, hotels, and so on and so forth. And lastly, 10% is consumer durables. So these four things contribute to the biggest chunk of the benchmark, which is around 80%. Then the remaining are all small weights uh, allocated to uh, healthcare, power, and reality. So those are the smaller themes, but the bigger themes are these four themes. Now, even if you look at the index, the index is around 90% large cap and 10% Sorry, mid and small cap. Um, whereas when we we managed to, we intend to manage this fund on a bottom up basis and find ideas across the spectrum, be, a, be it large, mid or small cap, which is why we think the strategy that we will run will more likely be sixty five to seventy percent large cap, uh, and the rest being in mid and small cap ideas. Uh, so that will be the differentiation uh, in terms of the in terms of the portfolio itself. Now, if you drill down into why consumption at this point of time, a couple of things. Consumption, we all know the markets rallied pretty hard over the last three, four years. But the fact is consumption has actually lagged the markets uh, over the last couple of years. Even last year, uh, Nifty was up, Nifty 500 was up 40%, whereas the India Consumption Index was up 36%. Now, if you break it down, um, what you notice is that the the, the contribution to the performance came from three main sectors, which is reality, power, and autos. Now, I showed you from my previous slide, reality contributes only 2% of the index, power contributes only 3% of the index. Auto is still a meaningful contributor, but these two contribute together only 5% of the index. The biggest chunk of, con the biggest portion of this index, which is FMCG, which contributed 34%, has only gone up by 11%. So that's an underperformance of, uh, of almost 39%. So essentially, over the last one year, FMCG has underperformed significantly. Now, if you look at the uh, consumption index and if you look at growth expectations versus ROE, uh, now if you compare Nifty consumption index and Nifty 500, what it is telling you is that in FI25, the growth expectation for Nifty consumption index is 20%. The benchmark is 14%. For 26, the consumption expectation is 23% EPS growth, whereas for the benchmark, it is 17% EPS growth, and the ROE is also expected to be better. So now you've got an index which has lagged uh, Nifty 500 over the last one, one and a half, two years, and has got better fundamentals, uh, at least expected fundamentals for FI25 and FI26. 
So fundamentally, that puts the whole uh, um, theme in a better position to do uh, to do well. Now, within that, if you look at how does Nifty consumption index behave in different market scenarios? Firstly, what you notice is that since 2007, the uh, index itself has outperformed the market in uh, in 11 of the last 16 years or something. Don't hold me to the exact number, but that is what the strategy is. So it has outperformed in majority of the times. But if you look at specifically look at down years, Nifty consumption index does extremely well. So in 2008, when Nifty 500 was down 57%, uh, uh, so Nifty 500 was down 57%, the consumption index was down only 43%. Similarly, in 2011, when the index was down 27, the consumption index was down 10%. Uh, so there is an outperformance of around 17%. So it also is defensive in nature, given, given the sectors involved. And so it does particularly well in a down cycle. Uh, and I can highlight a few things, which is that uh, the beta of Nifty India Consumption Index is 0 0.7, 0 0.77, uh, which is substantially lower. And that explains why in a down market, the kind of consumption market, uh, consumption uh, uh, portfolio tends to do better. Now, to reiterate the point that these sectors have lagged markets over the last five years, um, this is a slide showing increase in multiples. Now, Note this consumer consumption uh, index and subsectors have always been expensive because they've always traded at a premium to market. Premium will not come down. But if you look at difference between, let's say, 2013, uh, 2019 to 2024, uh, consumer durables and apparels has gone up from only 40 to 45. Whereas if you look at something like capital goods, capital goods has gone up from 22 to 48. Electronic manufacturing services have gone, gone from a price to earnings multiple of 23 to 53. So essentially, these have outperformed to such an extent and there has been a significant rise in multiples, whereas that has not been the case with the subsectors that dominate the Nifty consumption theme. So again, reiterating the point, essentially that it has not as benefited as much from the rally and that also puts it in a good defensive position and good kind of point of entry for, for the theme itself, right? Um, and lastly, how uh, how this uh, how this theme will be different compared to the existing offerings? Firstly, uh, this is a very broad, uh, very broad uh, index and hence the portfolio will be very broad with exposure to different sectors. And if you look at the overlap by weight, the overlap with Nifty 100 and Nifty 500 is only 32 and 34%. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that if you buy the consumption index, you have only, or if you buy into the consumption NFO, you are likely to get a portfolio that has very little overlap with Nifty 100 and Nifty 500. Um, so that also gives you uh, diversification. It gives you uh, uh, in, it gives you uh, exposure to new themes and new ideas that probably is not captured under the diversified uh, funds uh, otherwise. Um, with that, I will kind of stop. I'm happy to take questions.